Hey everyone, I hope and pray that you all are having a blessed day. Um, here on behalf of Dad to set up for the second night of the virtual revival, he was called away and had to go take care of some things. So, waiting a couple of minutes for people to start coming on, and hopefully Pastor Rob, who will be bringing the word tonight, will be here shortly. Um, anybody who sees this and can hear well, just let me know, make sure the sound works okay, and we'll see if we can't figure this out. Pastor Rob, if you're on here and you see this, maybe just comment in case it doesn't show up. Let me know that you're here. Everybody here okay? Awesome, thank you. Just waiting on Pastor Rob to come in here so I can add him. Awesome. Let me see if I can. There you go. Okay, say something. Make sure your audio is good. Okay. What about okay, that? Okay, gotcha. You're good. Okay. okay. Right. Whenever you're ready. Well, praise the Lord, everybody. I, I told uh, Deborah I wasn't sure how this worked technically, so uh, we'll do the best that we can tonight. It's great to be here. I appreciate Brother Blake Mullins for the opportunity to join with you and to uh, share the Word of God a little bit. And, uh, you know, if you're passionate for the Lord, and I suspect most of you are, um, that, that passion for the Lord translates into passion for the people. Because um, the Lord's passion is for the people, for his creation, for the saved and the lost as well. And, uh, of course, in today's world, in today's time, we, most of us should be fully aware of the condition our world is in. Um, not just the chaos and, and some of the things, but just the blindness. The Bible says the God of this world has blinded the minds of of the people and so we understand that to be true and so as as a christian that's a concern to us um as we look around and we see what's going on in people's lives uh it certainly bothers us um it's something that uh, i i i see on a daily basis that uh, i wish i could change i wish i could fix some things but um i know that within myself i'm first limited and I also know with God, people have to respond. Um, and so if you're like me, I'm praying about things and I'm believing God for things and I'm looking for change and I'm looking for progress. And uh, I, I'm, I'm not a kind of person who wants to give up. Even when the signs point in a certain direction, I know that God can turn things around and change things. So I want to take a few minutes here and share some things with you from the book of 1 Samuel chapter 14, um, this is prior to David's encounter with Goliath. This is during the time of Saul's reign, and we're going to read about Jonathan particularly here. The Bible says in 1 Samuel 14, 1, that it came to pass upon a day that Jonathan, the son of Saul, said unto the young man that bare his armor, Come and let us go over to the Philistines' garrison that is on the other side. But he told not his father, 
And Saul tarried in the uttermost part of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree, which is in Milgron, and the people that were with him were about 600 men. So we, we can see from this context here that there was an ongoing controversy, actually, if you read the scripture, uh, between the Israelites and the Philistines. And we know that during the time of Saul, the Philistines frequently got an upper hand. Often they would steal the, or the, often, but they stole the ark and carried it away. And uh, that was because of the weakness of the kingdom under Saul, because Saul did not line up with what God wanted to do. And so if we drop down to, to verse six, so this, this, uh, this conflict here between these two, the Israelites and um, the Philistines. And so we can see what's happened here is that Jonathan's sort of broken away from his dad. And he says, we're, we're him and his, his armor bearer said, we're going to go. We're going to go down there. And uh, this is what the Bible says in verse six. And Jonathan said to the young man that bear his armor, come and let us go over under the garrison of these uncircumcised. I love that the Bible says that. Now, it's not an intention, in, in, my, in my mind, it's not an intention to demean them. It's, a, it's an intention to, to understand them. And what Jonathan is saying, he says, look, this is what David would say a little bit later about Goliath. He's, he's an uncircumcised. And in other words, his, his heart wasn't right. He wasn't in line with God. He didn't have what he should have. And so Jonathan said, Jonathan said let's go over under the garrison of the uncircumcised, it may be that the Lord will work for us. I love that text. It may be that the Lord will work for us. Reminds me of the three Hebrews approaching the fiery furnace. Here's what Jonathan said. For there is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few. And there is no restraint to save by many or by few. I want to talk tonight a little bit about the remnant because I think, certainly think that is a relevant subject in these last days. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you for the establishment of your truth. I'm grateful tonight, Lord, that we can have confidence that what you've written in your word never changes. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so we look to you today in confidence and ask you to bring your anointing and share with us from your heart to our heart. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, looking at this, uh, that Jonathan says to his armor bearer, it may be that the Lord will work for us, for there is no restraint to the Lord to say by many or by few. I, I wish we got that. I, I wish more people could, could get that deep down in their understanding. I wish we could push things away and out of our minds and the, the lives of the enemy and the ways of the world and the condition of what we see around us because it, it works against us often because we look at how bad it is and we look at how, how messed up things are and we look at people's resistance to the, the ways of God. And those things are there and we don't deny that they're there. But, but what Jonathan is saying, it could change. He's saying it could change. Things could be different. He said we, we never know that how God is going to work for us. And he said there is no restraint to the Lord to say by many or by few. So in, in that statement, I'm reminded, first of all, of, of Gideon. And we know what happened with Gideon. He had 32,000 soldiers. That's a lot of people. He had 32,000 soldiers. But we know that God cut that down, cut it down, cut it down to the point of 300 soldiers. So we look at it. I know as a pastor, if I went from 32,000 to 300, I'd be heartbroken. I would be upset, and of course, I would be concerned about the 31,700 people that were no longer in the army or with me in, in the battle. But the point of the story here with Gideon is that God was going to save by a remnant. He was going to take the few that were left and do what the 32,000 may not have been able to do because of their inability to come together. And so there was something about the remnant that, that we can see here in the text of Gideon. These men, the Bible let us know, are men of faith, men of one faith, men of coming together. They all did what it was that Gideon told them to do the way that Gideon told them to do it. You can't substitute the, the importance of that or, or cancel the importance of that because when we come together, when we work together, when we do what it is that God wants us to do, 
as one, when we respond together as one, it is impacting. And in this last day, I wish we'd get the whole world to go. I wish we'd get everybody that says they're a Christian to do it. But I want to tell you, what we need is a remnant. What we need is a group of people that will do what it is that God is asking them to do or telling them to do. These men, these men of faith, put a, a, a trumpet in one hand, a pitcher in the other hand. They put a lamp on top of the pitcher, and they slipped into the enemy's camp at night. The Bible says they broke the pitcher, and they blew the trumpet, and they made a declaration, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon, because what was happening there was they were breaking the pitcher and let out the light. Let's let out the light in these last days. I know people that are reluctant. They're holding back. They're, they're concerned. They don't know quite what to do. I want to tell us what we do today. We shine the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We refuse to let the enemy put us in darkness and hold us in a place of darkness. And they sounded the alarm. They were, de they were declaring, we need to sound the alarm today and do what it is that God has us to do. Now, if we look real quickly at Gideon, I love the study of Gideon. I love to look at the story of Gideon. Gideon was a nobody from nowhere because a lot of times we can feel that way. You feel like we're, well, we're unimportant. We're not those people or we're not the ones with the microphone or we're not this or that. And, and so we can feel pulled back a lot of times. But what we see here with Gideon was Gideon was a nobody from nowhere. When the angel came and began to talk to Gideon about what God wanted to do in his life, Gideon's response was who his family was and who his family wasn't and what they had never done and how things had never been important and, or how the family had never been important. And so we see that the angel goes to Gideon. Actually, where he goes and finds Gideon is hiding. He's hiding. He's hiding. He's hiding in a threshing floor, but it's not the threshing floor. It's the wine press that they turned into the threshing floor so they could hide from the Midianites. So this is a man, Gideon, who's been through something. He's dealt with stuff and he's had things happen in his life. And, and when he looks at his life, he thinks, I can't because of this and I can't because of that. And the devil will lie to you and he'll lie to me. And he'll tell us that same thing. He can't because of this and we can't because of that. But I believe today that what the Lord is looking for is somebody that is willing. Humility would be important. It, it, that, that's a, a valuable piece. And here we find that Gideon is falling on the floor. He is down in a low position. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God and he will exalt you in due season. So Gideon is also, or at least later, named Jerubabel. Jerubabel was his symbolic name. It wasn't his, his, his name was Gideon, but Zerubbabel or Jerubabel became his name later on because he was the enemy of Baal. I want to, I want to tell you today, I always did nickname me the enemy of the devil, the enemy of Satan, you know, the person that is, cause that's what, that's what Gideon does. He goes out, he's turned down Baal. That, that's the Jerubbabel, the enemy of Baal. He's turned down those false gods. He is doing a work for the kingdom of God. I want to be that person. I want to be who it is that God wants me to be because he was against the God of the Gideonites. He was, he was out to, to resist the God of the Gideon, or the, the God of the Canaanites. And the reason why is because the Canaanites were the very people that was inhabiting the promised land. Now you got a promise today. And this is what I want to talk about for just a second. You have a promise today, a promise of God that God has given to you. And what is the enemy trying to do? He's trying to occupy your promise. He's trying to keep you out of what belongs to you. He's trying to tell you that it's God promised it to you. God promised it to Abram and Abraham and the seed of Abraham. And now these Canaanites are hiding out there. They're, they're living there. The Philistines are some of those people. And they're there because they refuse to give up what belongs to the people of God. And so Israel, the people of God, need to take back what belongs to them. And today, I believe we need to be praying more, reading more, reaching more, doing more, believing more, and just pressing into things of God in these last days. Is it difficult? Yes. Can we find ourselves discouraged? Absolutely. But what we should do in all of that is press into what God is doing. The enemy is doing his best. He's doing his best to beat us down, doing his best to keep us from being the remnant that God wants to use in these last days. I really believe that God wants to use a few people. He's not to use a lot of people, but he's got a plan for the ones that won't to use the ones that will. 
He's got a plan. And I'm thanking God today for the remnant. Now, with Gideon's story, we find that Gideon's hiding. He's hiding. And a lot of times, I find that to be true. People hide. They'll hide from God. They'll hide from the preacher. They'll hide. And what I'm saying by that is, they, 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 in their discouragement, they'll just sort of draw back and they'll pull away and, and they'll, they'll resist. But I'm saying God wants to do something in our lives. I'm grateful that the angel showed up in the threshing floor, in the wine press, and got a hold of Gideon and drew him out of that place. And God wants to do the same thing to us as well. See, God had delivered, and this is an interesting piece of that story, God had delivered the Israelites into the hands of, Mid of the Midianites. Here's what happened. Israel had disobeyed God. Israel had failed to follow the true instruction of God. Because they did, God said, I'm going to turn you over to the Midianites for seven years. For seven years, I'm going to let the Midianites kind of have their way with you. And the Bible tells us how harsh it was, how difficult it was for the Israelites during that seven years. The Midianites would come in when they would, the Israelites would plant the fields, they would work the, the, the fields, they would get everything ready. When the harvest started to come up, here come the Midianites. They would come in, they would tire everything down, wipe everything out, and destroy the crop, destroy, destroy the harvest, or take what they wanted. And year after year after year, we see that happening. But God had delivered them into the hand of the Midianites for seven years. But at the time of Gideon, the seven years was over. It was up. It was finished. I'm saying the season was over. See, the time of the seven years is how it was. It's just the way it was because they'd been turned over to the Midianites for seven years. But God said it's only for a season. There are seasons. And so we need to take advantage of the opportunities that God gives us in our season. So the Israelites had took everything, or, or the, the Midianites had taken everything from the Israelites, stolen all their stuff, taken their effort, and made their effort futile, and they were discouraged. But the season was over. You, you, you can see how this was working against their attitude or their hope and it was still in their strength and it was taking away the victory that they had as the people of God. And so God is saying, you failed. This is the penalty. But he's saying the season is over. So down there in that threshing floor, actually a wine press was a man that had been broken, a man that had been humbled, a man that had uh, gone through a lot and a man that was going to be called upon by God to take a few from 32,000 down to 300 and do a big work or great work in the kingdom of God. You know why? Because the season was over. When the season's over, God can take a nobody from nowhere and do a great work. When the season is over, the enemy season is over, God can take a 32,000 army, whittle it down to 300 and still get the job done. It's his pleasure to do it by many or by few. Jonathan spoke those words. What a beautiful thing because the season was over. Here was about, here's what was about to happen. I pray it happens tonight. I do. Here what was about to happen. The angel of God was about to come into that threshing floor and arrest this man we know as Gideon about to arrest him. See, we think of arrest in a negative way. We think of it having a, a negative connotation and something bad. But I want you to know when God arrests you, it's not negative, it is positive. That's what happened to Paul or Saul on the road to Damascus. God arrested him, knocked the Jesus, knocked him off his horse, struck him with blindness and began to speak to him and said, how long are you going to resist? How long are you going to kick against the pricks? How long are you going to keep saying no? And I believe God is speaking to people today, not just people that are lost, want them to get saved, but people who are saved and he wants them to get busy. He wants them to get busy. If we believe these are the last days, we need to be busy. If we believe this is the time of the final harvest, we need to be busy. If we believe that God wants to do something in these last days, we need to get busy. And if we don't believe God wants to do something in these last days, we need to get truth. Because I'm telling you, God wants to do a work in these last days. How's he going to do that work? He's going to do it through the remnant. He's going to do it through the people that will say yes. The word arrest, when you think about arrest, arrest means to seize, 
by legal authority and take into custody. Think about that for a second. It means to seize by legal authority and take into custody. I want God to seize me and my heart and my life by legal authority and take me into custody. I want to be, as Paul said, a prisoner of Christ, a person who, like Peter and John said in Acts chapter 4, we can't help it. We got to do it. You can tell us don't do it, but we got to do it. You can ask us and hope we'll quit doing it, but we got to do it. Why? Because there's something stirring in our hearts and we can't help ourselves. We can't help it. We can't but do these things is what Peter and John said. And so the enemy's trying to discourage us and trying to tell us we're nobody from nowhere and trying to put all these things and all this discouragement and look around and see all the difficulties and the struggles of our, of our world and our life. But what God is saying is when the season is over and a new season is born, I can take a nobody from nowhere and I can take a great army and cut it down to 300 and still get the job done. God can save by many or by few. I really believe what I'm about to say with all my heart. We are not here. We, the people of God in these last days, the last day church is not here in the earth to just watch the world crumble. We're not here to watch it fall apart. We're not here just to watch truth be trampled in the street. We're not here to just watch the great falling away occur. We're here to declare truth to whoever will hear it. We're here to hold up and rescue anybody that will hear the word of God as we declare it in these last days. We're here to get our friends saved, our loved ones saved. I may not see the whole world come to Jesus, but God help me get somebody to come to Jesus today, tomorrow, next week, next month, and until I either leave by death or I leave by cloud, let it be today that I am moving forward doing the work of God in these last days. I, I, I don't want to just watch the ugly go on. I want to be a part of the rescue. I, I, I know the Bible talks about when Abraham went down to Abraham went down to Sodom and Gomorrah and it was awful what happened. The fire came and, and rained down out of the cloud. But you know what Abraham did? He got a few out of there. He got a few out of there. He got Lot out of there and Lot's daughters out. He got a few out of there. God help us today that even though we see the pending destruction is coming, let's help us pull some of them. The book of Jude said, save some with compassion and some with fear, pulling them out of the fire. Let's be passionate about these things in our lives because God wants to turn some things around. What the devil meant for evil, God can make it good. He can. He can make it good. While truth is being trampled in the street, it can be reaffirmed in the hearts and lives of the people in the house of God. That's what can happen. While the world is falling apart, the bride of Christ is being made ready and making herself ready. That's what's happening. That's what the Bible tells us is happening. While there's a falling away, there is a falling away. There is a gathering, a close coming. You know, I was thinking about that remnant today. You know, it was a larger garment, and now it's a remnant. You know what that remnant is? It's not tattered. It's not torn. It's not destroyed. The torn part's gone. It's out. It's, it's gone. What's left is a remnant of the whole thing. It's a reality of how God can put things together and connect things together. It's that fitly joined together body that Jesus was telling us or Paul was telling us about because we know that is the plan of God for us to represent the body of Christ with our lives. So I, I know I read to you this scripture about Jonathan and his armor bearer and not Gideon. I didn't say much about it. So I'm just going to remind us again that, that what Jonathan told his armor bearer, he said, it may be that the Lord will work for us for there is no restraint on the Lord to save by many or by few. I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to give up. My grandfather, one of the things that I remember about him in the years that he pastored, it didn't matter if, if, if they had a project going on at the church, it didn't matter if, 15 people showed up or zero besides him. He was always there. It didn't matter. You know what was going to happen that day? Somebody was going to work on that ditch. Somebody was going to dig into the ground and make progress on the project. I wish everybody was in on this. I wish all the Christians would get involved, but I want to tell you what we're going to do. Those of us who will, by many or by few, the remnant, we are determined. We are determined to press on, to press on. In the book of Isaiah, Chapter 1, verse 7, 
I'm going to read just a couple of verses. I'll be done in just a few minutes. But in the book of, of Isaiah chapter 1, verse 7, the Bible was saying, Isaiah probably was writing, your, your, your country is desolate. Sounds right, doesn't it? Your cities are burned with fire. Sounds right, doesn't it? Your land, strangers devour it in your presence, and it is desolate, as overthrown by strangers. We see a world in such a desperate, horrible set of circumstances, whether it's the storms that we see in places, or whether it's the acts of men that we see in other places. It is devastating to see how desolate and how burned with fire and how devoured our world is right now. But, but, but Isaiah is writing about this. And the daughter of Zion is left as a cottage in a vineyard. While, you know, first of all, it's beautiful writing, it, but it's also poignant. It says, the daughter of Zion is left as a cottage in a vineyard, as a lodge in a garden of cucumbers as a besieged city. Zion, the daughter of Zion, as a besieged city. Except, verse nine, except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a very small remnant. I wish everybody was on board. I wish everybody was lining up with the truth. I wish, I pray that more people become passionate about God and about the things of God and about the people of God and the people of the world. I, I pray that that happens. But I want to tell you something. The Bible says that it would have all been lost except God left a remnant, a very small remnant. We should have been, he goes on to say, we should have been as Sodom and we should have been likened to Gomorrah. Hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom. Give ear unto the law of your God, ye people of Gomorrah. You know what he's saying? You know what the, the prophet Isaiah is saying? He said, we would have been destroyed like Sodom and like Gomorrah. We would have seen the ultimate demise in the end and we would have been destroyed. But God left a very small remnant, a very small remnant. So Isaiah was speaking about a remnant, a seed, a spiritual kernel. I love to study about a seed, a seed of corn, a bean, a wheat, whatever the seed is. There's something about, something beautiful about the creation of God that in that little seed is a mapping of all that is to become. You put that corn seed into the ground, and of course we know what's going to happen because we've seen it happen before. Put that corn seed in the ground, and a little few weeks later, there's going to be some little shoots start coming up, and they're going to start growing up out of that ground reaching up to this as the water comes and the rain comes in that's going to begin to grow as the sun shines it's going to begin to grow when the temperature's right it's going to begin when the conditions are right it's going to begin to grow and as that thing grows it's going to keep growing and growing and the the, the stalk's going to get bigger and it's going to get taller and eventually there's going to be some tassels come out on top of that thing and after the tassels come you're going to start seeing those little corns that are formed on the sides of the of the stalk and what's going to happen see that was all in the seed the mapping of all that was it's like dna in a person and what you're going to look like and and what the size your nose is going to be and how much hair you're going to have after you're getting older it's all mapped into that seed and that's what god does so christ says this jesus said this in john chapter 12 verse 24 verily verily i say unto you except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die it abides alone but if it die it bringeth forth much fruit. Jesus, of course, talking about himself. He's also talking to us because he said, he that loveth his life is going to lose it. And he that hateth his life in this world should keep it. So here's what we got to do. Die to the flesh. We got to die to the flesh so that we can live Christ. We got to die to the flesh so that we can have the fruit that comes from our own death. That seed has to go in the ground and die. But when it dies, the mapping of what's inside of it is going to bring forth a harvest. Somebody once said, you can tell how many seeds are in an apple, but you can't tell how many apples are in a seed. Love that statement. You can tell how many seeds, you can cut that apple open and see how many seeds, six or seven or whatever's in there. You can cut it open and look, but you take that seed and put it in the ground, 
you don't know how many apples that tree is going to bear. Whether by few or by many, God can save and turn things around. So let, let the Lord make you aware of your place in the remnant and what you have to do with this last day work that God wants to do in our world. Gideon out there and his people, breaking pictures, letting out the light, sharing the truth and the declarations, what they did. They declared with a loud voice and they blew the trumpet and they let everybody know that the man, the nobody from nowhere, with an army that had been whittled down to a remnant, is here. And what happened, of course, we know was they had great victory. So we today need to be that corn that's sown into the ground. That we die to ourselves, that we die to our own wills and our own flesh so that we can live Christ. In Acts chapter 2, there was about 120 people in the upper room. They had to give of themselves. They probably wanted to be other places and doing other things, but they had to commit themselves to hear what Jesus said. What did Jesus say? He said, you go tarry. You go tarry until you be endued with power from on high. Outside that room, they're in the house. They're in the house. Outside that room, outside that house, there's 3,000 people that's about to be harvest. 3,000 people that are ripe and ready. But what has to happen is the remnant in the house has to die so that the harvest in the street can come into the kingdom. And what did God do? Add to the church daily. There had to be a seed, a remnant in the house to get the harvest in the street. For me, I can only tell you as a pastor, my own experience, for weeks, weeks, I, I find myself consistently dreaming about our church and about that mountain up there. I find myself over and over seeing progress. I, I'm, I'm dreaming about buildings and moving dirt and things happening. Now, do I believe it's the last days? Yes. Robbie Fultz believes it's last days. Can I tell you if Jesus is coming today or tomorrow? I cannot. In a month or a year, I cannot. Do I believe he could come today or tomorrow? Yes. Do I believe the signs of the time are pointing in that direction? Yes. But our instruction is to occupy till he comes our instruction. So, so I can't, I can't look around and say, Oh, it's tough. You can't get anybody to come to church or the falling away and truth trampling in the street as an excuse to not press. I need to be pressing. I need to be working harder than I ever have before because what's at stake is the, is the harvest, the harvest of the last days, the harvest that God wants to give to us in our lives. So I'll do one more verse and I'm closing today. So I hope they're ready on the other end over there to uh, catch me here. Uh, Jeremiah 10.10. 10. I love the book of Jeremiah, but I want to tell you, Jeremiah had a tough assignment. Because if you read the book of Jeremiah, you'll find out Jeremiah said a lot and didn't get listened to much. There's a lot of people who resisted or rejected what Jeremiah had to say. But it was the call of God. He had to do it, and he did it. But it wasn't easy. And that's why in one place he said, my bowels, my, you know, I could be on the screen, but I won't. I mean, but he was passionate. He, he said, this, this is hard. This is difficult. Here's what Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 10, 10. He said, see, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to do four things, root out and to pull down, and to destroy and to throw down. And then two more things, to build, and the plant. Now think about that. Root out, pull down, destroy, and throw down, followed by build and plant. Most any farmer can tell you, if you're going to plant a field, or construction people can tell you, if you're going to build a building, first thing you got to do is root out, pull down, destroy, and throw down. What am I saying? You, you've got to clear things out. You've got to get rid of stuff so you have a place for the thing that you're wanting to do, plant or build. 
you you have to deal with the negativity you have to deal with your own thoughts you have to deal with yourself you have to deal with the people who are pessimistic and ask you why you're wasting your time and yeah you got to do all that sometimes you got to stick the plow into the ground and break up fallow ground and just be determined to do what makes no sense at all to the people who but who can tell whether God will work by many or by few he's going to do it so if we will tear down root out if we'll clean up if we'll deal with the negativity then God will help us plant and he will help us build he will help us so my call to all of us tonight is to let the the new man the God man be in control you have somebody in your life that needs Jesus maybe somebody in your house that needs Jesus somebody in your family that needs Jesus we may not be able to reach the people around the world we may not be able to help all the people that we're passionate about but we're gonna try I, I, I believe the remnant is gonna try the remnant is not giving up the remnant is gonna press 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 we're gonna continue because that's who God has made us to be that's what we're gonna do we're gonna go into that enemy's camp we're gonna break the pitcher and sound the trumpet sound the alarm and make the declaration but I may not be able to get everybody I would like to get but I'm praying God help me get everyone that I can Help me not be the reason it doesn't happen. Wow. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you tonight, Lord, for hope. I'm grateful for what can happen when we line up with your word. Lord, in our season, in our season, we ask you to help us fulfill your work in this world. We ask you today, Lord, to help us see clearly and hear clearly and understand with clarity so that we don't fail and miss what it is that you'd have for us to do. We ask you today, Lord, to speak to every heart, to the lost man and woman, God grip their heart, to the saved man and woman, God grip their heart. We all need it today. We need a renewed passion for the you. And for your things we ask you lord to touch us bless brother blake mullins and his ministry and his work we ask you to bless his family that you be with him lord in the remainder of this revival online we ask you to touch the people lord that are watching by the internet tonight in jesus name we pray amen thank you and thanks to everybody that tuned in if you're watching this and you don't no, Jesus, don't know how to be saved, feel free to send a message, and we'd love to talk with you. Pray for the remainder of the meeting, and y'all have a blessed day.